Adam Tagger, through his prior YouTube channel, Wealthy On, and Thoughtful Money, has taught me so much over the last several of years. From his amazing interviews with some of the country's smartest people with the expertise in finance, U.S. monetary policy, America's debt crisis, and so much more. But you know what? I've never heard Adam have the opportunity to share his own opinions or assessments of our economy and our financial markets. And that's what you're about to hear. Adam is a dedicated husband and father and spends his life enhancing and educating others that we may have the knowledge to develop a resilient lifestyle, avoiding the pitfalls or traps encouraged by corrupt powerful people. It is my absolute honor to introduce to you, Mr. Adam Taggart. Adam, welcome, sir. Pleasure to be here. I'm so honored to interview you. I love your work. And uh, you've had a major shift recently. You recently left Wealthion. Uh, what can you tell us about that departure and what are you focusing on today? All right. Um, uh, departure, not too much except to say uh, if you watched Wealthion and you enjoyed it, um, Wealthion was um, a brainchild of mine, super near and dear to my heart. It had been a model that I had been looking, uh, hoping to create for about a decade. Uh, finally had a chance to uh, and then um, became far more successful, far faster than I thought it would, which is wonderful to be able to say. Uh, but the long story short is, is I, I didn't own the company. And uh, at the end of the day, as I'm sure you know, Todd, it's, 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 it's really all about control. As one of my mentors say, if you don't have 100% control, you have 0% control. And uh, the, the mission of the company, which is uh, helping the regular investor um, get educated and empowered to fund their life goals, um, I wanted to Obviously, it's a very important mission, very important mandate. I wanted to be able to do that exactly in the way that I thought would best serve my audience. And so to do that, I ended up just going fully independent and founding Thoughtful Money, which I like to tell people, if you liked what we were doing at Wealthion, you should love what we're doing at Thoughtful Money. It's sort of everything you loved before and more. And um, it's been off to a great start and, and, and hopefully continues to do so. I've been self-employed since 1989. And through the years, I've had also some partnerships. And I had someone tell me the only ship that sinks is a partnership. <laughs> and I've, I, I never, I mean, it, it's amazing because, um, you know, and I've JV'd a bunch of deals. I've been in the real estate business my whole career. And, you know, I've JV deals with people. And that's kind of cool because you, you, get into bed together for a shorter period of time. You know, you're not, uh, you, you do the project, it ends, everybody gets paid, and then it's it's uh, on to the next one if you choose to, you know, work with them again. Uh, but you've had an amazing career. I mean, so many accomplishments. Just to point out a few positions, I mean, you worked as a finance analyst for Merle Lynch back in the day. And this is really amazing. You became Yahoo's vice president of marketing for the entire North America region. Uh, and you also co-authored a book called Prosper. What inspired you? I mean, with Wealthion, and you're, you're right. I mean, it was amazing to watch your growth to where you're getting hundreds of thousands. I mean, I think I saw something on your LinkedIn where in 2020 you had quoted how many subscribers you had. And I mean, you just blew up, you know, because people were really interested in you know, what your education, but Adam, what inspired you out of, you know, throughout your career to create such, you know, an educational platform about the broken policies, government corruption, dysfunctional monetary policies, you know, how to invest your money. I mean, what, where did the inspiration come from? Um, I, I'm so glad you're giving me a chance to talk about this because I, I actually, I, I usually do the interviewing, so I don't get to do that many interviews. And when I do, people just want to talk about the markets and whatnot. And, um, and I love having a chance to talk about the mission. So thank you for giving me a chance to do that. Um, it, probably like most people that are cause driven, um, it, it goes back to um, my for early formative years. So um, uh, without 
bring too much of my personal story into the mix here. Um, my, my parents got divorced when I was very young. I don't even remember them being married. Um, my mother got custody of my brother and I, and um, we grew up uh, with her in a household where, you know, money was always tight. It was always a, a, an issue. And as a single parent for much of her time bringing us up, um, you know, she was she was stressed a lot about money and she she didn't have any real education around how to build wealth. Um, you know, she had been a, a stay at home uh, spouse for the, the most uh most of it when she was married to my father. Um, and, and so basically I saw her have a lot of anxiety and make a lot of, quite frankly, bad decisions around money. Uh, and she ended up fast forwarding to, to later in life. Um, she ended up uh, being very financially dependent upon my brother and I. She, she you know, ended up hitting her senior years with, without any real savings. Um, and, uh, that really, you know, stuck with me as something that, okay, as, as, as a child growing up into an adult, I wanted to be a provider for my family and, and also for her. Um, and, uh, and I ended up, um, I was from a family of doctors and was originally, the plan was to go to medical school. In fact, I was just about to apply to medical school. And this was in the early nineties when the Clintons took over the, the healthcare system and every doctor I knew uh, including those in my family were telling me, look, don't go into the profession right now, do something else for a while, let the dust settle. We don't think this is going to be good for the profession. And so I had to figure out what to do uh, as I was graduating college uh, and uh, ended up going to work, as you said, uh, as an investment banking analyst for Merrill Lynch on Wall Street. And there I got a front row seat into uh, how when you look at the 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 list of stakeholders for whom Wall Street serves, the actual client is like at the bottom of that list, <laughs> that Wall Street serves its own interests first and foremost. Um, I didn't like the culture there. Uh, it just wasn't a good fit for me. And so sort of as a way to escape it, I, I went to business school. I went and, uh, went and got my MBA at Stanford. And when I was at Stanford, the internet revolution happened. Uh, and so I ended up, uh, well, I joined a startup briefly, but then I went to work for Yahoo and I, and I started my career at, at Yahoo as the head of marketing for Yahoo Finance. And this is really where I kind of began to combine my interests with uh, this, this cause that had just been driving me, which was, okay, I was, I was beginning to see how uh, media, particularly this new digital media format, could really help educate uh, people better about how the economy works, um, how finance works, and how uh, how to build wealth um, than many traditional solutions that were out there. Um, and you know, looking at what my mother had gone through, and, and looking at how broken basically the Wall Street model is in terms of caring for actual client capital. Um, as time went on, I began getting more and more intrigued and inspired by the role that that media, but especially digital media, could play as an educational and an empowering tool. And um, what was interesting is I, I, I started reading um, uh, on the internet. This was during sort of 2002 through 2007. Uh, I was living in, in uh, Silicon Valley at the time, starting a family, um, was looking to buy our, our house, our first starter home for my family. And I could not believe how expensive homes were there. And uh, you, know, you may remember back then it was the housing bubble number one. So every year housing prices were getting higher and higher and, and harder and harder to just justify in my mind. And I was thinking, I just spent all this money going to an expensive graduate school to get this, this MBA. And, and I can't wrap my head around why housing is so expensive and people are willing to pay so much for it. So I went online to try to understand what was going on. And what was very interesting is, is I found my way to these voices. And it was a small number of voices, but many of whom you know, uh, Todd, because we just talked about some of them, like Peter Schiff was one at the time, who were warning about a growing asset bubble in housing. And what was so interesting was the majority of like the mainstream financial media was totally ignoring this, or in certain cases, with Peter being a good example, they would bring him on as sort of the guy to, to ridicule right during the, the the segment on 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 the the business uh program and um and what i found interesting though about these these small number of voices that were were ringing this warning bell was that they were the only ones who had data 
right? Everybody else was basically pushing a dogma, right? No, housing never goes down. We've never had a national housing price correction, right? Even even the uh, head of the central bank, head of the Federal Reserve at the time, was was echoing the same sentiments. Well, then fast forward, the the housing bubble burst, the global financial crisis uh, started in earnest, and it was a massive validation for me. Uh, of the power of, of these folks who had been using actual data and, and real objective analysis, um, they were basically unveiling the fact that um, a lot of the conventional direction for wealth building that was sort of being sold to the general masses was not in the best interest of the general masses. It was to benefit the Wall Street machine uh, or to benefit uh, their big advertising partners. And so um, at that point, I was... It had risen up through Yahoo to the point where, yes, I was uh, vice president of marketing for North America. I really just had trouble carrying on doing what I was doing because I didn't feel like it was making a big enough difference in the world. If I if I got another person to play Yahoo Fantasy Sports on their phone, per se, like that wasn't making any kind of difference in the world that I wanted to make. I wanted to look at the people who had, had just gotten injured by this, you know, massive losses they had taken either in their housing, their home prices, or in their portfolios. Uh, and help better educate them exactly the rules of the game that's being played so that they could make more informed decisions going forward. So I resigned my position at Yahoo. I ended up uh, creating a company called Peak Prosperity. That's where I wrote the book Prosper that you referenced. Um, then fast forward about 10 years after that, I had this vision for uh, a, a platform that could um, bring the best minds in money and the markets to the average person to try to reduce the information asymmetry that Wall Street had enjoyed over regular people. So Wall Street has all sorts of resources, but but certainly a lot of them intellectual resources that had largely been ring fenced in the Wall Street world. Um, now through the power of, of digital financial media, we've got the ability to basically bring those same people and that same thinking to the average investor. Um, and then I think even just as important, information in and of itself doesn't have value if you don't put it into action. So how do we help people actually take steps based upon those insights? That's the second half of what I ended up building in this platform was connecting people with financial advisors who take into account these big macro trends, which to be honest, Todd, and we can talk about this a little bit later, kind of the average you know, stockbroker, average financial advisor, they don't really take into account one because they're they're sort of they operate inside this large machine we talked about that just wants to get you to put your money in the products that's going to make Wall Street the most money. But to be honest, they're just not that intellectually rigorous. And to a certain extent, that's not really their fault because the system and all the um, intervention of the the central planners, particularly the central banks like the Fed, you know, they created this era where passive strategies did just great and you had the Fed put and you just bought the dip, right? And so a lot of investors just got very used to kind of investing on easy street. And now that we're getting to the point of the story where that's no longer working anymore for a whole bunch of reasons that we can talk about, um, you know, there's a lot of people that are getting caught flat footed by that. And again, that's the whole reason why I wanted to build what I built here now with Thoughtful Money, which is... Um, you know, how do we get that that information, that expertise from the experts that are truly understanding the game, transfer that understanding from the experts to the average investor, and then empower the average investor to basically build portfolio strategies that are much more reflective of real reality? You know, you describe these stockbrokers, <laughs> reminds me a lot of real estate agents, and you know, this this narrative uh, you know, they build this for over a hundred years. They've built this machine that obviously profits the uh, the industry, the big players in the industry. And, uh, you know, and then it's, as we know, uh, in our world, we're seeing this play out now with all the lawsuits against the big brokerages and the National mm -hmm. Association of Realtors. And it's like this, you know, bubble mentality. And like you said, I mean, unless people tune into youtube or you know i mean they have to, where do they get the information mainstream media is pushing their own narrative they're you know they're they're talking about what they're told to talk about and you know all these special interest groups and things like that it's just it is it's scary and um i want to ask you, you know and and um like i said in the beginning i mean i'm a fan of your your channel uh you know when i'm whenever i'm 
you know, uh, have time to, uh, you know, whether I'm on the elliptical, or whether I'm driving, I like to tune into your channel and uh, your, your interviews are great. You always, Adam, seem to ask, start out with asking your guests the same question. And I would like to, with your permission, ask you that question. So <laughs> as, as you know where I'm going with this. I do. Is it okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, hit All me right. with it. All right, so what's your assessment of the global economy and financial markets? <laughs> Um, I don't do many interviews. One, because I've got such an aggressive interview schedule that it's I'm always sitting in, in the seat you're sitting in now. Um, but but also, I think one of the reasons I don't is so I can avoid very direct questions like that. Um, and, and to be to be super transparent for folks, um, while I've spent a lot of time in the uh, in the financial industry uh, and I talk to a lot of experts, um, I don't consider myself um, a financial guru like the folks that you generally interview, Todd, or the folks that I interview on my channel. Um, if anything, I, I think I probably consider myself an expert of experts. Like, if you want to know what different experts are thinking, you know, I can, I, I, I can condense that for you and tell you, you know, what Danielle DiMartino Booth or Felix Zuloff or, or Lacey Hunt thinks. Um, but yes, I absolutely do. Sort of create my own synthesis based on all the people I talk to. So I'm, I'm gonna answer the question as best I can uh, based off of what I've put together from all these conversations. But I do just want to underscore for folks that I'm, I'm uh, you know, I, I don't run uh, an analytical firm the way that a lot of other folks that you and I talk to normally do. Um, so uh, from a global economy standpoint, um, I think we have an economy that has been, um, uh, just artificially juiced for so long <laughs> by the central planners and um, has been um, just tremendously stimulated and, and deformed by that stimulation um, in the post COVID era, right? And uh, I think right now, probably the biggest question on the economic side is, um, it, it, is that stimulus gonna be able to continue uh, and keep the 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 game going um, for longer, you know, it, 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 keep it in stability for longer, or are the lag effects of of all the distortions that we've done to the economy over the past several years going to catch up with us? Um, and I think right now that is sort of as as an investor, that's the big question you get to ask yourself: Is it truly different this time? Um, are we in some sort of permanently high plateau um, that's supported by these extraordinary measures by the central planners, um, or will history eventually repeat itself and will math eventually catch up to the system? Um, based on the preponderance of folks that I've talked to, um, I, I think it's more the latter. I think we have pushed out the lag effects by the trillions of dollars in both monetary and fiscal stimulus that have been pumped into the system. Um, I think the, um, the big story of the past year plus has been um, a rising net liquidity that has kept that recession that everybody expected at the beginning of 2023, right? I think uh, I just saw a, a headline from a year ago that said that the, uh, uh, there was um, uh, basically 100% of, of the economists that had been polled um, in this particular study were predicting recession. And of course, it never materialized, right? Um, why did that happen? It's because so much liquidity has been continued to be pumped into the system, um, largely of late on the fiscal side. Um, you've heard me probably rail with a lot of my guests that uh, that our current uh, deficit in terms of as a percent of GDP is at levels that we've we've only seen before in America in times of war and, and like like world wars, like where we've mobilized the economy. Uh, around producing war material, and we've been, you know, shipping hundreds of thousands of troops abroad. Um, but we're we're not in that type of war right now. In fact, you know, we have a quote unquote strong economy right now, or in peacetime. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it's only those extraordinary measures that are keeping things looking pretty sanguine right now. If you look at at the headline data, um, if you if you scratch, and in a lot of cases, not very much below the headline data. You see a lot of concerning elements, um, you know, that are that are lying just beneath. And maybe we'll want to talk about some of this stuff. But if you look at the jobs numbers, if you look at the retail sales numbers, 
uh, and we're a, a, a you know 60 68 I think percent driven uh, consumer spending uh, g- uh, economy right now. Um, there's just a lot of of fault lines or fracture lines that are showing that um, things may not be as rosy as as we're being told. You know, right now the dominant narrative is uh, the big debate between are we going to have a soft landing or no landing, right? Um, everyone sort of seems to think that a recession's like not even possible this year, right? Um, well, you know, you raise interest rates uh, faster and uh, and more intensely than you ever have in history. You know, history shows there's likely to be a price you have to pay for that. That's what we talk about, the lag effect, right? Um, and, uh, you know, I think we're beginning to see, we can we can talk about, you know, lots of different elements uh, in society. In fact, I've got kind of a whole litany here. If, if we get a moment, I can, I can bang through a bunch of them. Um, that suggest that those lag effects may actually be underway. And again, it's it's just been masked to date by this this rising tide of, of net liquidity that's been pushed in the system. But we have a lot of um, elements of that liquidity that are beginning to get pulled away. And I think what, what's going to happen economically is we're going to see um, uh, sort of like what, what Warren Buffett has said, um, which is when the tide goes out, you know, you can see who's been swimming naked. I think we're going to start seeing some of that uh, uh, I, I think we're going to start seeing more of that as the year goes on. Now, uh, the second part of that question is what's going to happen with the markets. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the markets have been a really interesting game. Um, again, they're, they're hugely um, uh, respondent to liquidity. So as long as net liquidity is positive, markets tend to go up. And if you look back at, uh, at liquidity flows and uh, the S&P, um, you'll see basically they were negative in 2022, which is why stocks and bonds had such a bad year. But liquidity flows turned net positive in October of 2022, right? And that's when everything turned around for markets, right? And they've done nothing but power higher since. Um, there's a lot of sentiment involved, obviously, as well in market prices. And what we saw um, over over this past year is you know, the markets were just looking for any excuse to go higher, right? And and as Jerome Powell kept coming out and saying, look, you know, our key priority is getting inflation under control. We're going to be higher for longer. The market kept saying, no, I, I, I don't I, I don't agree with you. And the market kept pricing in more rate hikes than um, uh, the Fed was saying it was it was going to do. And what was so interesting to me is, is every time one of those two parties had to blink in that game of chicken, it was the markets. Right, the markets were wrong, and they had to keep resetting their expectations. But the issue is, is it didn't matter. Right, stocks just kept going up all through 2023. So um, we're at a point now where we're now finally, Jerome Powell and the Federal Reserve have given the markets what they've wanted, which is they've come out and they've said, "Hey, you know what? We're actually done hiking. The next thing we're going to do is a cut. In fact, we're probably going to do three cuts going forward." Um, markets just took that as a signal to go off to the races, right? And so we're now in this, you know, melt up that the markets have been going in. So I think from a market perspective, you have to ask yourself, okay, how sustainable is that? Especially in a world where, in, you know, while, while Powell's been talking a confident game that it looks like inflation's getting under control, it's still yet not under control. And, you know, I, I do think inflation, um, it's the Pareto principle, the first 80% of inflation is a lot easier to get under control than the remaining 20%. And the, the most recent um, uh, January inflation data that surprised to the upside, you know, one data point that suggests, yeah, inflation may be a bit stickier than the Fed uh, expects here. So, you know, the Fed has said it would like to do three rate cuts this year. At one point, the market was pricing in what, like six or seven rate cuts. Um, now, the Fed may, may have to start pushing you know, pushing off into the distance when it can start cutting rates because inflation is, is remaining so resistant. And who knows? It may have to push those rates out to the end of the year, maybe into 2025. Maybe, maybe you know, we, we, we don't get our three rate cuts this year. Um, uh, so, you know, right now, I think the markets are priced for, I don't want to say perfection, but pretty close to it. I mean, they, they are priced for a sunshine and rainbows and unicorn environment that very well may not materialize this year. So um, when I think back to the, the folks that I talk to, um, what, I, what I do, and maybe you do the same thing, Todd, is when I hear a number of people coming to the same conclusion, but they come to it via different pathways, some of it very technical, some of it fundamental, some of it based on history, 
um, when they when they even though they're using different disciplines, when they come to the same outlook, I generally place greater confidence on that prediction because it's being found by a multiple, it's, it's being arrived at by a multiple of, of different routes. Um, and what I've heard from folks this year that that sort of, this is, this is what I think the markets are gonna do this year based upon what they're telling me they think is gonna happen, is that Q1 is, is gonna be a great quarter. Um, in fact, uh, Felix Zuloff, you know, called this back in like late October of last year. He said, Q1 is going to be great for the markets and the economy is going to look stronger than most folks expected. Well, that seems to be the script that's playing out right now. But markets are going to get, get ahead of themselves. Um, and uh, he believes, like I do, that uh, the lag effects are going to start to become more visible as we begin to enter Q2. So high water mark, high, high water mark for markets by the end of Q1, things start to nose over. Now, in Felix's uh, world, he says that uh, you know things could get pretty rocky from then on. He's not necessarily calling for a 30% drop in the markets, but he thinks the potential for that to happen is there. A couple other folks I've talked to have pulled that number 30% uh, out of the air, as, or, or not pulled it out of the air, but they pulled it out of their models. So I don't know if we're going to get a correction that strong you know, as we go into the end of 2024, but my sense is, is yeah, we're probably going to set a high water mark at the end of Q2. It's going to get a lot more uncertain um, and probably a lot more. Um, you're going to start seeing pessimism start creeping into the market, um, which we haven't seen since 2022. So I imagine that we end the year materially lower than than we do and uh, the end of Q1. Uh, but it's probably going to be pretty volatile, you know, a little fit starts. Um, and of course, you've got the wild card of an election year in there. So um, you know, a lot of people think, hey, there's no way um, the, the the power structure uh, is going to let the markets go out of control heading into, um, uh, you know, a key presidential election. Um, I, I, could be true. Um, two things I would say to that. One is, is, is there, you know, basically almost two years now of lag effects hurtling at us from uh, the, the tremendous amount of rate hikes we've done and the amount of quantitative tightening that we've done. And secondly, I keep talking about this thing called a lag effect, right? Which is when a policymaker, you know, pulls a lever. Um, it takes usually several quarters for the impact of that lever to be reflected um, into the general economy. Um, so, you know, we keep talking about these rate hikes that, that we did. Um, yeah, it takes anywhere from a year to a year and a half for those to be fully expressed in the economy to slow the economy down. Same thing happens on the other side, right? If you try to stimulate the economy, um, it takes a while for that stimulus to get into the system. And so since we're now entering, you know, mid-February or soon be in March, I'm not really sure that there's much that they could do uh, in terms of new stimulus uh, that they can shove into the economy to actually make a difference before the November election. So uh, long-winded answer to your story, but wanted to give folks the full context there. Um, but yeah, from a market standpoint, I think we continue to to ride to some blow off top high. I don't know how high it could be. It could still go a lot longer from here. It's gone longer on than I thought it could, but could it go further still? Absolutely. Um, but then I think the the rest of the year, you know, you probably want to get a lot more defensive than folks are right now. You know, a uh, couple things that have come to mind um, while you're explaining your thoughts on the, the markets. Um, two books, Wisdom and Crowds and The Tipping mm -hmm. Point. Two great books that, you know, I, I believe that there is wisdom in crowds. And when you start to see people, now there is definitely a divide and you can't always assume that the crowd is the wisest and with their, you know, with, with their conclusions. But there are a lot of people that uh, with that have a lot of good sense and study the data to know that if we don't have something bad happen, a downturn, some kind of a depression or something massive based on the growth that we've had, it will have defied all other circumstances throughout you know, the last 250 years of the United States. But Adam, what point, now I just came back from a trip. I went out at, to uh, out close to you. I was in Washington State in Seattle and I interviewed Wafed Bank CEO, uh, how do you think the emergency bank funding program 
played into, you know, the markets being so strong. I mean, I think of when do we start to see the uh, economy collapse and 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 uh, unemployment rates start to get high? It's usually when you have some kind of, you know, um, uh, pullback of lending from banks and you know the, then the, uh, the the businesses can't get the funding that they they want or the credit tightens and they can't buy their next season's inventory or they can't bankroll their payroll until their customers pay their bills i mean when when the banks really never uh saw much of a you know hiccup there was a crazy couple weekends i mean obviously the march 12th weekend with you know the banks collapsing silicon valley starting that i mean there, there were people were like whoa but then when the fed came out and announced how quickly they were going to you know make everybody's deposits and they were going to put this money at par and allow these banks to just continue this you know uh lending effort do you think that played into the market growth that we saw in 2023? And if so, do you think they're going to sunset this like they said in March, or do you think they're going to end up extending it? Okay. Um, so absolutely, I think it played uh, a role in restoring market confidence uh, and leading to the exuberance that we see right now. Um, I think desperately... Well, look, I, I, I think we have a system right now that um, if just left to market forces, um, we would have massive deflation, right? I mean, asset prices would, would take a tremendous correction um, and we'd have a bunch of bad debts that would, would uh, default, right? And I, I, that, that's just the system that we've accreted over time with, with all this massive buildup in debt and all this continuous intervention that's needed to keep it from collapsing. The problem is, is that, um, or depending on your point of view, from my point of view, the problem is, is that, um, you know, nobody wants that system to clear because the, 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 the pain of the clearance is more than any politician or, or any, you know, bank president uh, wants to be presiding over. Right. So um, we, we had this period basically between the global financial crisis uh, up until 2022, where, you um, Everybody was just accustomed to, hey, we don't have to worry about taking any pain because if anything starts to, you know, get a little wobbly, the Fed or the other central planners are going to get in there and fix it for us, right? And they, they, that, that was a rewarded strategy, you know, from from '09 to beginning of 2022, you made a lot of money just expecting the Fed to have your back, right? So um, I, I think after the year of 2022, where you know. People took losses they, they weren't expecting to take in this new world order. Um, the Fed was trying to restore control in, in the system, confidence in the system. Um, and by stepping in and patching up the banks um, as, as fast as they could with their monetary duct tape with the, the BTFP, um, you know, I, I think they had to because I think the system is so fragile that that could have spiraled out of control in the banking system. But I think for, for you know, investors, that sort of gave a sign of like, okay, Okay, we were kind of wondering where the Fed was in 2022, but now we know they're back to their old rescue mode now, right? Um, I think a, a question that I've been asking a lot recently is, um, in the wake of uh, COVID, the COVID crisis, um, you know, we, we turned the, the stimulus dial up to 11, right? So we had a monetary rescue of a scope we've never seen before, but we had the fiscal side kick in. And as I mentioned, we're still doing just tremendously extraordinary fiscal spending right now. And it's it's kind of morphed from being an emergency measure now to just kind of business as usual. And so the question I've been asking a lot of my guests is, is there the political appetite? Is there any politician right now who would willingly get up and say, yeah, you know what, guys, we had to do this, but now's the time to start tightening our belts we got to adopt a little bit of austerity. We can't keep doing this forever. And the answer I'm getting is, is no. Like they just I don't they, know how they, they can. legitimately I, can't expect someone it, doing that. It would be massive devastation. I mean, if you just you talked about asset prices. I mean, just think about the lesson that would need to be learned uh, with the amount of consumer debt alone. So if we start to see and this is where I where, you know, 
I'm petrified over, you know, you think about, I'm in the housing market. Forget about, you know, the fact that people can't afford to buy a house and, and yet they want to keep saying, oh, the housing market's just going to, if you don't barber quicker and if you, if we go down, you know, interest rates, get another five in front, you know, a five in front of them, mortgage rates, you're going to see it skyrocket and home prices are going to go up 20%. I mean, Adam, people are, man, they're in, they're in trouble. I mean, we're starting to see it show up in the neighborhoods, the distress, you know, where, and, and, and no one wants to talk about it. So if you say what politician in their right mind is going to come out, I mean, I ask all the time, where, where the heck are all the leaders? I mean, where is someone that's going to step up and say, you know what, guys, we screwed up here. And, and, and that kind of gets me to let, let's talk about, um, you know, it's interesting because look, Tucker Carlson's in the news. I'm not trying to, you know, endorse or play the political roles, you know, the, whether you're a Republican or Democrat or whether you're independent. And uh, I just I, I know one thing. Very expensive to live now, more expensive than it ever has been. You know, when you go to the grocery store, what used to be three dollars is ten. Right. And this has happened in a very short period of time. So, you know, everything's getting smaller. The boxes are smaller. The portions are smaller. It's ridiculous. You can't go to a restaurant, you know, without, you know, uh, blowing the budget and people don't have the money. But let's think about this for a minute. You know, I mentioned that uh, the United States of America was founded 248 years ago almost, right? So if we look at, um, let, let's just look at some of the, the, the history, and I want to pull up a chart here. Um, and, we're, you know, this chart basically is giving us, um, you know, the, some of the countries that have been around the longest. And I just want to look at, you know, how the U.S. compares in age compared to you know, hmm. these other countries. And if we look at Egypt, Adam, just to kind of contrast, we're 248 years old. And by the way, Adam, I'm 55. All right. So simple math tells me that about 22% of the, I've been around for 22%, 23% of the, the U.S. since it was created. My mom a third of her life, a third of the, the age of the U.S. my mom has has lived for, right? But when we look at this and we look at Egypt over 8,000 years old, you know, we were founded here in the country on principles of freedom, democracy, um, and many will say that we are way off of this, right? I mean, I've spent the last couple of months, you know, reading about you know the creation of the federal reserve you know the jekyll island i asked brent uh beardall the the ceo if if that that was a true story if that you know if if you know four of the six people that went and created uh is said to have created the federal reserve if four of those people were working for or directly under jp morgan and when i look at where we are right now i mean in your opinion, what is becoming of the United States of America? Are mm. are we losing the freedom here that our forefathers established? Um, I, I, I think the answer is yes, for sure. And um, uh, we could have a whole long discussion, I think, just on the decline of, of, of personal liberties um, that we've we, we, we've we've seen um, diminish. Um, I, I would say at an accelerating rate over the past decade or two. Um, but it's something I talk an awful lot about on my channel, um, and it's coming up more and more, and it's just you're coming up organically now, um, is the bifurcation of society right now, where a growing, a, 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 the majority, uh, or let me put it this way, um, a growing percentage um, of the majority of the populace is beginning to lose faith in the social contract. Right, where they've said, "Hey, look, this is a this was a country that was, you know, basically birthed in meritocracy, right? And I could come here and I could work hard, um, and over time, I could improve my station and I could give myself and then my children a better future than, you know, my my lineage or my my parents had." Um, and uh, I think people are really beginning to lose faith in that. And, and I don't know if you've got kids. You know, I've got kids that are college age. Um, that age cohort is is pretty demoralized um, before they've even gotten out of the gate, right? They, they, they look at how unaffordable life has become um, and uh, they look at, at what they consider to be sort of diminished prospects. And a lot of them are just saying, geez, why, why even try, right? 
So, you know, we're, we're seeing um, more and more of the wealth and the prosperity of this country concentrate into the hands of fewer and fewer people. And this kind of goes back to the mission of why I founded Thoughtful Money in, in, in the first place, because I'm, I'm trying to do my part and trying to undo as much of that as I can for as many people as, as I can. But, um, you know, we have a system where, um, look, wealth concentrates over time, power concentrates over time, and those who build power then tend to reinvest that power to their own advantage to continue to slant the playing field even more um, in, 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 towards their interests. And so, you know, we're at this point right now where um, uh, the vast majority of the wealth is in you know, the, the top 10%, I use this stat all the time, the, the, the 93% of all stocks are owned by the top 10% of households, right? So um, when we have these interventionary uh, episodes in the, in the markets um, that then drive up asset prices, that doesn't help everybody equally, right? It helps those who own financial assets, which as I just said, is, is a relatively small minority uh, of the country. Um, you know, at the same time, um, a lot of these interventionary measures uh, have real repercussions like inflation and driving up the cost of living, right? So to your point, um, I, think, I think since 2020, groceries, the average grocery bill has gone up by 25%. Um, if you look at the other essentials for living, you know, whether it's housing, whether it's uh, healthcare, whether it's insurance, um, whether it's uh, energy and fuel, um, in many cases, those have gone up even more, right? Um, while wages have not nearly kept pace, right? So, you know, people are getting squeezed uh, on their, their real ability to save, which is why we've seen the savings rate plummet, right? Um, we're now seeing households um, basically do the only thing they can do, which is turn to revolving credit to try to make up the difference. And so we've seen an explosion in revolving credit. Mind you, that's coming at a time where uh, the, the rates on that credit, the APRs on those credit cards are the highest they've ever been. Right. So we're seeing people increasingly squeezed. Um, uh, and, you know, at the same time, we're being told, hey, everything's going great. This is Goldilocks, everybody. Right. Economy is growing at four percent plus, you know, super low unemployment, inflation, you know, under control now or practically under control. And people are saying, well, wait a minute, like, you know, <laughs> my cost of living isn't going down. My wages have only recently, on average, started outpacing inflation, but but not by much. And that's coming after a very prolonged period where they were drastically underperforming inflation. And the jobs market isn't really when you when you look at beneath the official data, it's not nearly as rosy as the official headlines tell us. And anecdotally, more and I don't know if you've been seeing this, Todd, but anecdotally, more I'm just I'm hearing stories about very qualified candidates who are actually having a lot of trouble finding work. And we keep hearing that, oh, there's more openings than there are jobs and anybody who wants a job can find one. Um, I, I'm hearing a lot of anecdotal evidence that that's not the case. And I'm seeing a lot of data that suggests that more and more companies are planning layoffs this year. And we've actually had more layoffs. Uh, the pace of layoffs at the beginning of 2024 has far outstripped 2023. And by the way, layoffs in 2023 were 98% higher than layoffs in 2022. So we already kind of have this culling of the workforce underway. It's just not making its way into the headline data yet. So back, back to the spirit of your question, you know, I talk a lot about, um, uh, this growing wealth divide and, and the concern that I have, which is I don't see a way in which this gets reversed anytime soon. Like I, I, I always like to try to find hope in the story, but I have a hard time seeing here, um, unless we get back to a period of, of very prolonged high economic growth um, for years, um, it seems to me that that this this gap is going to keep growing, and right now it's growing at an accelerating rate. And and the concern that I talk about with a lot of people um, is, what if the what if the breakage that we need to worry about is not a financial one? What if it's a what if it's a societal one, right? What if it's one when enough we hit that critical mass where where enough people have so much despair over their future where they just basically say, look, the system's just not working for me and, and we just got to start breaking it or, or rebelling against it. And look, mm. I'm not talking about Lord of the Flies. We've seen you know, countries recently that have had super extreme 
um, examples of this, like Sri Lanka, where the, basically the country just showed up at the presidential palace and just dra dragged the guy out. I hope and I don't think we're going to necessarily get to there. But I think what we may, how that may manifest is we will have increasingly sort of desperate um, selections in our elections of leaders that we're going to we're going to we're going to gravitate to people who um, speak to the pain of the populace, um, which is good, but but may end up having solutions uh, that aren't good for our long term uh, outcomes. And uh, I, I was talking to behavioral economist Peter Atwater about this, and and he has a great quote. Uh, it's scary, but he says, um, if you're if you're standing out in the cold rain long enough, you'll get in the car with anybody. Right. So, you know, if, if, if you're a frustrated, um, you know, member of the populace, just feeling increasingly dispossessed and ignored and uh, and and, uh, you know, I think just uh, exploited, you know, by the current system, the first candidate there to really talk to your pain is the guy that you're going to you're going to line up behind. And, and whether we get a strong man um, and that that tends to be what catapults strong men in, into office is somebody who who, you know, says, hey, look, people, I'm going to fight for you. Um, or whether we end up going, you know, to someone who's sort of on the extreme progressive democratic socialist side. And look, I try to be very politically agnostic, um, but I'm not a big fan of socialism. And um, but I, I understand it. Like, I understand the appeal of democratic socialism or, or even just socialism, socialism uh, to these younger generations, because they sort of feel like, look, I I'm going to get screwed either way. No matter who's in power, I may as well vote for the guy who's promising me free stuff. Right. So I, I, I do worry very much about the trajectory of where society is headed here because I, I don't see a lot of immediate hope for restoring, you know, a, a credible sense of prosperity back to the to the, the middle class and, and, and the average worker. And, and I'll take a pause and let you react in a sec. But um, I think we're past the point of painless reforms that everyone's going to agree on. Like it very well may take higher taxation, you know, of of uh, higher net worth and and, and higher uh, uh, earning uh, people to to try to right the balances. And in general, I hate redistrib redistributive policies, right? But in, in, in unless we find some way to tap into a capitalist solution that just you know yields excessive growth that that we currently just do not see on the horizon. Um, it's probably going to require some degree of surgery like that to try to try to address this uh, this growing societal anger and ire that's very well deserved. Uh, and if we if if we don't start having the hard conversations of of solutions that that could you know potentially help, then I think the odds of you know kind of full blown revolt get even higher. And that, I find that really scary. You're not kidding. You know uh, a couple things. You speak about uh, the, the potential of you know, raising taxes for those that can afford it. Yeah, I mean, and by the way, super quick, I'm not necessarily uh, promoting that, but I, I I have talked to enough people to say that those are probably things that are going to be put on the table and will be considered at some point. You know, and I don't think that I, I think for many. Uh, and 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 when you talk about the the wealthy, I mean, there's you know people that are in that top 10 percent uh you know uh earner category and then you have the elitist right i mean you have the ones that i mean they, look they have every loophole they have it's their system and yeah. i mean they do nothing but benefit from it i mean you we print a whole lot of money during the you know the the covid era and where does this money end up right it ends right back into the pockets of the you know of the elitist right they and and so what happens, what I'm concerned about is not the fact of, hey, I would be willing to pay more money. You know, uh, I have no problem in contributing to the debt. It, so long as that the debt, that the, the spending that they're required to actually live within budgets, yeah, that's the problem. You know that as well as I do. I mean, we have a, and I have a lot of friends of mine that work in the government the federal government, state government. I mean, I, I'm in Maryland. We are loaded with government jobs here, all right? Everywhere you turn around. 
I also know that they set up these annual budgets and they have to spend it all, whether they buy extra toilet paper that they don't need or whether whatever it is, they have to yep. deplete those those uh, troughs, right? Because if they don't, they will not get that same amount next year or they certainly right. can't ask for more. They'll dig up roads that certainly don't need it. Right. I mean, I, I, come on. Can't you fill a pothole? What happened to those days? I have a park, you know, that I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about right now that uh, they must have spent a million dollars on renovating this park. I mean, with all the best playground equipment and that's I mean, that's wonderful. But w at what community um when when do they ask the community for their opinion or you know before they you know we elect these people they have no terms you know and they just continue to you know do whatever the heck they want to do and i think that's how do we i mean let's turn to money monetary policy for a minute what do you think of modern monetary theory well you know Look, uh, what's the old saying? Look, if you could print your way to prosperity, we'd all be speaking Latin, right? Because the Romans would have figured it back out, right? They figured it back out you know, centuries ago when they, they were starting to you know, clip their coins and, and, and intentionally dilute their currency, right? Um, so I think it's one of those things that, you know, hey, who doesn't want to be the, the person at the forefront of that who is basically giving all this new free money to everybody, right? I mean, what a, what a wonderful place to be and everybody loves you, right? Um, nothing's free. Like I said, there's no free lunch. You have, you, you have to pay for that. And, and look, even irrespective of something like monetary, uh, modern monetary theory, um, we have a, um, a fiat monetary system that is dependent upon forever expansion, right? And uh, just in and of itself, that means that the currency loses purchasing power over time. Um, when you look at the amount of debts that we've brought into the system and now have to bring into the system, um, in, in, in both in terms of to keep the system going, uh, but also as part of our monetary creation, right? Fiat is basically a debt issuanced uh, monetary system. Um, you know, that that debt, as you as you issue it and, it and it accumulates begins to accumulate exponentially which means that your purchasing power is just going to decline exponentially and so um you know i've talked to a lot of folks uh on the channel particularly recently about how uh the situation that the u.s finds itself in and um you know where does it go from here and in most cases everybody basically says well it goes to the japanese playbook right um, where you just keep issuing more and more and more debt and more and more and more currency uh, to just try to hold the system together. And um, you get into all sorts of things like yield curve control, right? When you have a ton of debt, you can't let that debt get too expensive because the interest cost on the debt starts wiping out your ability to do anything else. And we've, we've seen a preview of that over the past year, right? You know, our, our national interest uh, debt servicing cost has exploded. It's now over a trillion dollars. Um, and so when you do that, the, the one very predictable event is you can't have a free lunch, so something has to pay for it. And it's the purchasing power of the currency that gets sacrificed to keep the system limping along going forward. So, you know, I'm sort of jumping to the punchline here, but when, when I look at the long-term arc of where we're headed on a macro standpoint, it is in lower and, and on an accelerating basis um, acceleratingly less purchasing power for fiat currencies going forward, even for the almighty dollar. And so I think, you know, for anybody who's got a really long-term outlook on their wealth, you've got to, that, that's like the primary question you've got to ask yourself is how do I, how do I keep my wealth ahead of the, the rate of, of uh, decrease in purchasing power? Because I think that's the one thing that we can all count on as like a near certainty in this environment. And that's even without tapping into MMT. MMT just makes that worse a lot faster. How about the uh, central bank digital currency? Do you think that, you know, I think of, you know, um, the cash, right? A lot of people, they, they like the cash. They don't trust banks. Adam, I can remember, you know, my grandfather not trusting the banks. And, um, you know, that's why a lot of these people that went through the Great Depression, they buried their money in jars. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, you know they under the mattress or what have you. But there's still a lot of cash in circulation, and I think that really irritates our our current government because um, you know the only way that they can figure out the wealth. Uh, is to have a track of everything, right? I mean, they, they need to control it. So if you have cash, they don't know about that, right? So now they can do things like, well, if you go into the store and you buy something over $1,000, well, we can make the store report them because they actually have cash. But mm-hmm. do you think they will do everything? And, and it, 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 I just ask, uh, Brent, the CEO of Wafed, I said, well, are they going to get rid of cash? And he's like, no, they're not going to get rid of cash. That, If you can believe bankers, uh, they tell you that their bank is fine and they collapse the next day. But uh, that, no, we're not going to get rid of the cash because people don't trust. You know, they like to have the the, the even that fiat currency in yep. their pocket. Do you think on the path that we're headed right now, do you think that they will continue to do everything they can to eliminate, they'll be wiping this out? I I do over time. Um, I don't necessarily think, you know, a year from now, they're going to force us all at gunpoint to round up our cash and and hand it over to our government overlords, but who who knows? Um, Yeah, this question comes up a fair amount in the discussions that I have with folks. Um, And I would say, uh, pretty much everybody I talk to says, um, yeah, there probably will be CBDCs in the future, but, but we actually already kind of have a digital dollar. I mean, not, not that many people, um, use cash as their primary, uh, way to pay for things anymore. Right. You know, we've got debit cards, we've got Venmo, we've got all these other things. Right. Um, so the dollar is increasingly becoming digitized and I agree to your point, which is look, yeah, if you're if you're if you're a member of the government, yeah, you know you don't like cash at all, right? You 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 want to be able to tax all that commerce that you currently are blind to right now, right? So just just on a a self interest in terms of filling our coffers, right? If if they could all of a sudden take the whatever it is, forty uh, percent of transactions that are still done in cash, I'm pulling a number out of the air. You may have a better one than I. But if they can, if they can actually start taxing that stuff, yeah, they'd do that in the blink of an eye if they could, right? And then, of course, there's the whole, you know, other aspects of CBDCs, which you know could be of of, of interest to a a government authority, right? Of like, oh, I want the ability to freeze your accounts if you're doing something that we don't like, uh, or, or eventually, you know, eventually it just might be like, hey, look, you know, we we've calculated your tax for you, and we're just taking it, <laughs> we're waiting for your tax return, we're we're just going to take it, right? So there's all that stuff that speaks to the loss of, of civil liberties that we talked about earlier. Um, but the other thing, Todd, that I, I think is important to note here um, is I think one of the things that's going to grease the skids for this adoption will be the next crisis, right? So um, look, I think you and I, we can rail against um, the long-term corrosive effects of just sending checks directly to households, right? Um you know, it creates inflation, which we just experienced in spades, right? And it diminishes the purchasing power of the currency, all that type of stuff. Um, but uh, but the average person, especially when they're in crisis, yeah, give me the money, right? So we basically let uh, the genie out of the box here, which is we've just shown that the U.S. government is capable of sending direct relief to households when times are tight. So you better believe that the next time that we enter into a recession, the clamor from the populace is going to be, hey, please send me some relief, right? So, you know, if they send that relief to you in terms of digital dollars, right, that, you know, can only be used digitally. So the government has full control or full clarity and and visibility into what's going on there. um, That's going to be a great way, you know, to start getting more and more people onboarded into using and getting more comfortable with digital dollars and whatnot, right? So, um, and then you've heard about, you know, uh, the ability with with digital currencies like this, where, you know, you can you can use them in a targeted way in a crisis, right? Like, hey, we're going to give everybody three thousand dollars this month, but you have to spend it in the next three weeks or it goes away. Right. So it can be used to really drive specific short term policy things. Right. And who's going to turn away that that free three thousand dollars? Right. Nobody is. Right. So um, I, I, I think that this combination of like using crises and the populace's the appeal to the populace of this free money is just going to 
make this sort of a foregone conclusion in the long run. How do we protect ourselves from, you know, the currency uh, depreciation? You know, I, I talked to like Peter Schiff, Mike Maloney, and mm -hmm. they talk about gold and gold. silver. Yep. And, you know, I'm thinking to myself, geez, well, that sounds great. We'll work. We'll turn our um, fiat currency into real money or at least what we believe back, I mean, in history as real money. But what do you think that that's still a safe way to go? Where do people park their you know, fiat or exchange their fiat currency to protect their wealth? And, you know, and somebody had told, and, and, and sort of a sidebar to this, and, and I'm ignorant to this, Adam, so forgive me, um, but I was told now with like a lot of these uh, bullions or, uh, you know, uh, that there's chips inside of them now that you have to, you know, that the government is, you know, <laughs> putting these chips inside of the metal that uh, the silver, the gold so that they can know where it is. Know where it is. Yeah. I mean, have you heard about that? I mean, do you think gold and silver is still the safest place to park your, or exchange your fiat currency for? Yeah, I, I haven't heard about the chips and the metal, so I'm not going to comment on that because I'd just be commenting from a position of ignorance. Um, a short answer to your question. Um, yes, I think that precious metals um, play a prudent role in anybody's portfolio um, for, for two reasons. Um, the primary one is for uh, protection of purchasing power. So predominantly for that. The second one is just sort of Armageddon insurance, right? I, I don't lie awake at night uh, worrying too much about financial Armageddon, but it has happened uh, in history. And, uh, you know, if you have even a you know, few ounces of gold, uh, you sleep better at night knowing that if, if somehow we woke up and the absolute worst happened, um, you would have more gold than 99.999% of the rest of the population and could do something with it, right? Um, but, but that aside, um, yeah, the name of the game, as I said earlier, is to, to, to really try to figure out how to uh, keep ahead of the pace of decline in purchasing power of the currencies. So precious metals have been a time-honored way to do that back since the Egyptian days, right? So you've got, you know, the 8,000 years of history working uh, for your benefit there. Um, but they're not the only, they're not the only uh, asset. Um, and, and, and to a certain extent, you know, gold's actually done pretty well in, in past years, um, but it did not do as well as a lot of people who bought it thought it would do in an era of 9% CPI, right? Which we all know was a higher, some double digit rate of, of, of true inflation, right? Um, and uh, if anybody's been a precious metals investor for, you know, as long as I have, you know, 15 years, um, you, 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 it, it's hard not to conclude that it does get somewhat manipulated around by various players. Um, and if you've owned like the mining stocks, um, they have broken your heart way more years than they've, they've paid off for you. So I caution people from just pushing all their stuff onto the precious metals side of the house. I think you should build a diversified portfolio of assets that, that uh, have a collective and proven record of delivering long-term returns that outpace inflation. And, you know, um, first of all, you want, you want to try to hold some real tangible assets or, ac or, or, or claims on real tangible assets. Uh, and tangible assets are important because they cannot be inflated away. They have an intrinsic value that cannot be inflated away. So real estate is a part of that. Um, but also, you know, getting exposure to certain commodity types beyond just the precious metals themselves. Um, I do think that people should probably have some... Uh, exposure to the producers because they are leveraged plays on those those assets. You just have to understand that commodities in general are pretty volatile and the, the producers are a lot more volatile than the commodities themselves. Um, there are ways to structure um, fixed income uh, portfolios that uh, in decent times can can pay you rates that oftentimes will, will outpace inflation. And that's great because you can sleep really well owning those uh, the, owning those assets because they they offer a relative safety while providing you a cash flow stream. Um, equities play a role in this too. Um, you know, the stock market has outpaced inflation um, for most of history. So, you know, I, I think you just want to put together a very planful um, 
portfolio of assets that, you know, the common thread is how do I keep ahead of, of, of the decline in purchasing power, um, but use time honored investing principles um, to both protect yourself from undue volatility uh, and, and try to give you as good of a, I can't say guarantee, but, but good of a probability of real returns over time. Um, a lot of people, you know, we don't get, this is something I forgot to mention and why I, I, I created Thoughtful Money, is our education system completely fails us in terms of teaching financial literacy. And so um, we have a populace that, you know, gets pushed out in the real world. And if they're fortunate enough to start earning enough income to start being able to save part of it, um, they feel very vulnerable about being the steward of their own finances because they just don't feel prepared to do so. Um, so a lot of people have a lot of anxiety around just managing their money in general. But when you factor in all these macro risks that you and I are talking about, Todd, a lot of people get downright, you know, petrified. Um, they almost get to a point of, of, uh, of uh, you know, they're just like immobile. They just don't know what to do. And this is where I think, you know, the importance of finding a really good financial advisor who takes into account all the issues you and I are talking about here, because many don't, um, that's where they really prove their worth because they can, you know, help you construct this type of portfolio, walk you through it, make sure you understand what's going on. And then if you want, execute it for you so that you can focus on the other things in your life that demand all your attention, like your job and your family and life and all that type of stuff. We talk about securities, the stock market. I mean, do you think, I mean, I look at what these stocks are trading to earnings and I, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm like, this is crazy. It, it, this is and it's all based on consumer confidence, right? They see, oh, and sort of a little fear of missing out. You know, if I don't jump in now and the stocks are going up, I, and then all of a sudden, like what you mentioned earlier, if we see a 30%, you know, stock market, uh, which would be a crash really uh, to the stock market to see a 30%, uh, you know, decline. Do you think right now that we are in a stock market bubble? And what do you mm -hmm. tell these retirees that have these, you know, pension funds. And uh, I mean, they're, they're going back to work at 75 years old because, right. you know, they don't have enough money to live on. Yeah. Boy, you just like touched on like five uh, really strong interests of mine. Um, one of which is how unprepared Americans are for retirement. Um, when you look at the, um, it's, it's, I think it's something like, I mean, over 50% of seniors, of people hitting retirement age don't have anything saved for retirement. It's ridiculous. Um, uh, so, um, you know, we've got, we've basically got this, you know, even if the markets don't crash from here, we've got kind of a, a retirement unpreparedness crisis on our hands. And that's at the boomer level, right? And the boomers are doing better than most of the other uh, younger cohorts are on track to. So we've got this, this massive societal unpreparedness for retirement, which is a whole discussion in itself we could, we could have on a different day, uh, Todd. Sorry, and then another topic for another day too is, is the vulnerability of our pension system right now. Uh, because of the years of ZERP, um, pensions had to stretch for yield. And so we, we think of pensions as being loaded up on like really safe bonds. Um, I've talked to um, pension experts, um, one of which has the um, award for having received the largest whistleblower award for, for um, basically exposing uh, underfunded pensions. Um, and he basically says that like safe bonds are, are almost like the low, the, like the lowest percentage asset that, that pension funds now owned. They've been loaded up with all sorts of junk, largely private equity, highly speculative um, instruments that Wall Street has sold to it because it promised them higher yields during the era where, where hedge funds were really starved for yield. And so a lot of these things are just ticking time bombs, right? So again, whole other discussion topic for a different day. Um, but, um, but I do think that um, markets are, there's, there's, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. I mean, the markets are highly overbought right now on a lot of different dimensions. Um, the, the challenge here is, um, you know, how much longer can that sustain for? Like, I, th I, I think, I think that the, the big problem here is, is we've built this system that requires all this continual intervention, right? So it basically has two states. It's either rising or like it's in crisis, right? 
And so um, it, can, it can rise for prolonged periods of time. And, and what will happen is somebody who's afraid of the crisis, the, the crisis risk, and I've seen this happen many times over the past two decades, is they will convince themselves, you know what, markets are, are too rich right now and I'm worried about a collapse. So I'm just gonna like totally get to cash, maybe own some gold, but I'm just gonna like sit on the sidelines. And then they sit and watch the market go up for years. And they're missing out on all those gains and their their savings isn't growing and it's just getting eroded by um, inflation and loss of purchasing power. Um, so you, there's a danger of, of trying to get too exact in timing the market where if you miss it, you can you can be sitting out for you know very prolonged periods. And of course, what tends to happen to those people is they finally say, oh my gosh, I can't stand this anymore. My idiot brother-in-law is making a ton of money on NVIDIA. I got to get in. And then they get in and they get in right before the whole thing right rolls over, right? So um, I think the important thing to, to note is um, one, you know, at any given time, how overbought or how overvalued are the markets? And that's a big thing that I try to do with, with Thoughtful Money is to have this weekly drumbeat that's just, I, I sit down with financial advisors and go through, you know, the major indices on, on all these different metrics and just try to get a sense for if the elastic band is stretched, how stretched is it right now? So you, you have a, you have the best sense we can give you of what a, a correction risk might be at any given time. Um, uh, so you want to, you want to, you know, stay on top of, of, of sort of how overvalued they are, but you know, look, Market crashes tend to pe tend to catch the market by surprise by definition, um, but I, I think to a certain extent, if you're going to build wealth over time, if you're if you're, you're going to grow your wealth over time at or above the rate of um, of inflation, um, you you, ha you have to be invested to a certain extent. You don't have to be 100% invested all the time. Again, this is sort of measuring how stretched the band is. That's when you know sort of how much liquidity, how much safety to keep in your portfolio. And then another thing that I think is super important, and this is something I, I really emphasize with our financial advisors on Thoughtful Money, is the importance of having hedges in your portfolio. So it's basically insurance. It's, it's, a, it's a way to be in the market um, and you limit a little bit of your upside risk because you're buying basically an insurance premium against catastrophic risk. And so by doing that, Okay, yeah, if you have the the misfortune of being in the market at one of those times where all of a sudden the the you know all, all the artificial support isn't enough and the market enters into a downdraft, you're hopefully going to, you know, protect yourself from half or two thirds of that downdraft by having those those hedges in place. So I think like it or not, we're, we're we're just having to deal with a market environment that's probably very different than what your parents had to deal with, you know, if they could just invest their money through the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, you know, they did pretty fine. Yeah, there was there were corrections in there the way there always are in a market, but it was a real rising tide. Now that we have this this risk of, of greater and more violent downdrafts, I think you still have to be invested in assets to to grow your your the purchasing power of your wealth over time or protect it at least. Um, but you have to do so with uh, it's a more complicated game. It's a more complex game. Um, and so you got to make sure that you're using, you're taking advantage of, you know, the, the time honored um, investing principles of diversification and, and uh, position sizing and, and, and all those key things. Um, but also with, with a laser focus now on risk management and, and basically at times, you know, expecting that you're going to lose money at certain times. The goal is just to lose less during the bad times so that you can, on average, outperform in the long run. But it sucks. I got I to be honest. I mean, it, 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 it's not fun. You know, it, it's not as easy as it once was. Yeah. Let's talk about my business, the housing market. I've had financial advisors, uh, Adam, that have said some of the mistakes that you know, we, we've, we've built this, you know, uh, mentality, this philosophy of owning the American dream, you know, home ownership. And I've had financial advisors that have said that this is one of the biggest mistakes that a lot of people have made in their life they're not prepared for retirement because the only thing they ever invested in was a home they live there mm -hmm. for 35 40 50 years and you know now if they want the equity out of that investment that home they have to sell it or they have to do a reverse mortgage or they they have to do something you know um that's not really ideal but they have no other uh retirement accounts or you know investments do you think that 
if you're, you're talking to this younger generation right now that just really got whipped bad over the last couple of years of spending you know, mom and dad's gift money to overpay for, you know, $50,000, $100,000 over appraised value for a house. Uh, they didn't realize that the home is a depreciating asset that if they don't continue to spend money on it, it it's going to fall down around them and maybe not be an investment. Or they didn't realize that they don't want to live there for 10 years. They've only ever lived in an apartment or a house for the maximum two years or three years at the most. Now they want to sell already because they feel they've made a mistake. How do you advise the people, you know, the younger generation now uh, with, you know, an asset investment like real estate versus doing these other types of investments and maybe just renting for a prolonged period of time great um so uh i i just feel so much for the younger generations right now but housing is right at the heart of this um so i i think you just kind of put your finger on the solution to a certain extent which is um you know in your market be cognizant of what the economic differential is between owning and between renting because we've entered this period of time where in a lot of markets, it is a lot more expensive now to own than it is to rent. And um, look, I'm going to draw some parallels here, but um, uh, you know, there's, there's the old saying that like, you know, uh, or, you know, everything the government gets involved in, you know, gets worse. Right. And um, I'm here to we help. Saw this, we, yeah, <laughs> we, we, we saw the same. So we, we've seen it in housing, right? We've had all these programs to get people into housing so that they can become homeowners. Right. But, the fact that that you can get put in the house doesn't necessarily mean that home ownership is in your best interest, right? If you can't actually maintain the payments, right? And maintain the property, the physical depreciating property itself, right? People tend to forget that the houses are depreciating wooden boxes and they actually cost a lot to, to keep up. So it's it's not dissimilar to what happened in, in education, right? Which is where we used to have, um, if you wanted to take out a, a loan to go to college, you'd take a loan from a private lender, right? The, it, yes, there were there were Pell grants and there was some some government money that you could get, but it wasn't all that much. Um, and you'd have to go to a, a bank and you know basically negotiate. Then the government got involved. Uh, it's basically pushed all the private lenders pretty much out of the, the college game, um, and that enabled um, the uh, you know basically the government was willing to to loan as much as the individual wanted to borrow, and that enabled the colleges who had no. Uh, skin in the game in terms of whether the, the the borrower could ever repay their loans or not uh, to just inflate fees up to the point that the the, the market would possibly the highest point the market would possibly bear, right? So what happened is we had a bunch of people that were given the money to go to college that otherwise might not be able to uh, make the math work. Um, and what happened? You know, they get out. Many of them have degrees that don't have a ton of marketability, and they are debt serfs for the rest of their lives, right? And I think we've, we've basically been turning the housing market in, into a similar situation. Um, and so, um, look, I mean, you, you know this better than I am, sure, but, but really up until like the 90s, um, the, the price of housing pretty much kept, place with infl- kept pace with inflation, right? Um, it wasn't a speculative asset that it then became into around the turn of the millennia. Right, and that's because you know we had all sorts of securitization of of mortgage lent loans, and we had the Fed buying you know gargantuan's amount of mortgage backed securities, and you know it's been off to the races ever since. Um, and uh, uh, it, obviously, housing prices have have the the, the pace of price increase in, in housing has far outpaced income. Uh, and in theory, a, a house pretty much should be worth what local income streams should be able to support. Well, we're just so far away from that right now, right? And now we've entered this even worse period where, where personally, I think it's sort of a wily coyote moment. I was talking about lag effects earlier, right? Where we've had the cost of, of mortgages skyrocket, right? More than double, you know, in some cases getting close to triple at points where they were three, four, five years ago. Um, and yet housing prices haven't come down. 
right? At least not on average nationally, right? So it's like the worst time in the world to buy if you're, especially if you're a first time buyer, right? Am I gonna stretch myself to buy houses at the most expensive they've ever been <laughs> when mortgage rates are way higher than they've been for you know the past 20 years, right? It's a, it's a losing bet, right? For a lot of these people, right? So um, look, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of home ownership I'm a big fan of the role that that real estate can play in a portfolio, but you know it all comes down to value, right? You you have to get in at a good value, and um, and I'd love to hear your thoughts, Todd. I mean, the the how how much longer can home prices ignore the increase in the cost of capital? Well, we're seeing a lot of downward pressure, depending on the market throughout the the country. We're not seeing the overpraised value addendums anymore we're still seeing multiple offers <clears throat> in many markets but it's two not 25 mm -hmm. we're seeing where the house goes there, there's it's a tale of two cities no pun intended <laughs> where the house goes on the market it's either under contract within seven days or it's 30 to 45 days there really isn't an in-between so it's either sitting and a lot of that inventory is seeing price reductions it, it, so it, it's either snapped up or it's sitting for longer yeah so what's happening is the 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 list price is critical uh you know you can't overprice in this market right now um what we're really take you know when we look at and and by the way, you saying that the house is a depreciating asset, I come toe to toe with people all the time that tell me that that's just not true. The land increases in value. The home, you have to continually update. So if you've lived in the house for 30 years in now today's world, that means something where just two years ago it didn't. And can, I, can, I, can I add one point to that for you to react sure, to? Yeah. So I just saw a stat that said that the average house in America is 40 years old, right? I think 40% of the housing fleet is older than you and I, because you shared your age earlier and I'm about the same age. Um, and, and so again, these are depreciating wooden boxes, right? You need to continually invest in them to keep them habitable, right? And what's been happening since the pandemic is that more and more people have been saying, I don't have the funds to, to upkeep the house the way that it, uh, you know, the way that it needs to be upkept. And so they're skimping on upkeep, right? So that depreciating factor is, is increasing. And uh, you know this better than I, but my understanding of the housing market is, is since the housing market boom number one, and then, then the subsequent boom we've had, you know, the rush to build, the quality isn't there the way that it was in previous houses. So, you know, houses are more likely to depreciate faster just in terms of the actual, you know, quality of, of, of the structure because it, it, it doesn't have the quality inputs and craftsmanship that it used to have. Is all that true? It is. So we have a lack of workmanship, uh, you know, tr skilled labor uh, that, uh, that know what they're actually doing. So the oversight, uh, the builders are just pushing to get inventory uh, closed. They don't even care the fact that doors are warped. You know, uh, the drywall looks terrible. Uh, windows, in a lot of cases, having you know the cheapest uh, construction uh, methods to where you know they blow out the the gas blows out of the energy efficient window in five or seven years when it should last twenty, twenty five, thirty years. I mean, we're looking at everything in general but the biggest the biggest problem is the lack of affordable housing being built and a lot of that is because of the red tape that you know special interest groups have you know pushed their their uh their products and and how you know look i'm all about fire suppression systems but you have no idea what is involved in getting the amount of water to a home that will actually operate these sprinkler systems in the event that it's needed so if it's an older street the water lines need to be updated and they're pushing those costs to the builder or the developer stormwater management i i mean i understand you know a lot of what 
they're doing, but these costs and the soft cost of engineering and architects and, you know, uh, the permitting impact fees, reforestation fees, these costs are so expensive for developers and it takes so long for the developer to actually be able to stick a shovel in the ground. Sometimes it takes 10 years to bring a, you know, a property through the development phase to where they can build the houses. So a lot of these builders years in, you know, uh, in spending money. Now we have a affordability crisis, but that's why they're building these houses that are huge. 3,000, 3,500 square feet. They can't build a 15 or 1,600 square foot house and make any money. Um, so it's it, it's it's a mess. It's a mess. So this is the trap word. And just to add to this perfect storm, so you're talking about the, the, the red tape that's constraining inventory or, and certainly the type of inventory that we need, right? But then you've got the fact that um, boomers have not been downsizing um, the way that people expected. And even if they are, um, they often are not selling their the house they downsize from because it's appreciated so much. They're kind of looking at it like a stock in their portfolio and, hey, I can rent it out and make an income stream, right? So that 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 inventory is not coming onto the market to get get bought by you know a, a new buyer. Um, we've had the influx of institutional money coming into the market this time. So a lot of these all cash offers are coming from a deep pocketed institution that a regular person can't compete with, right? It's, they've got more money and a lower cost of borrowing than the average person does, right? And then you've had the whole craze with short-term rentals, right? Where people have been buying homes and converting them into Airbnbs because that's how they're going to get, you know, super rich. Um, I mean, I think the bloom is fast coming off the rows of some of these things, but these are all conspiring basically to, um, to steal inventory away from the average home buyer and obviously you know push prices up at the same time so we've got a ton going on there and if, if we've got time i've got one more thing i'd love to hear your thoughts on um, and i will get back to you on what my advice would be to a younger person who's looking at, at housing um, but here's something i scratch my head on a lot and i would love to get your thoughts on it which is okay let's say i'm a young couple right and i'm looking at buying a house in this market right super high prices super high mortgage rates I'm going to have to super stretch myself probably to get into this property, right? Um, and I'm going to make a 30-year commitment, right? Because I'm going to I'm going to take out a 30-year mortgage, right? Okay, if I'm looking demographically, you know, today, uh, 10,000 boomers hit retirement age, right? And we're and we're kind of beginning to get to the you know the 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 we're get, we're, we're we're not at the beginning of the boomer wave. We're kind of midway to entering the back half of it, right? In the not too distant future, let's say 15 years, right? That number is gonna to shift to 10,000 boomers dying or going off to the nursing home every day, right? So that inventory is gonna to have to be liquidated some way, shape or form, right? So there's gonna be a massive prolonged measured in decades selling wave as the boomers die off, right? And a lot of those properties are, are, are big properties, which we're hearing from these younger generations. They don't even necessarily want anyways, right? So there's just gonna be a, a dep like a, a prolonged depressive force down on housing based on that. Why would I wanna stretch myself today as a young person knowing that halfway through my 30 years, that's gonna happen? Yeah, so this is a... I'm glad you brought this up, actually, because what we're hearing in mainstream media is the housing shortage. In fact, we don't have a housing shortage at all. We have seven to eight months of new home construction inventory in areas that are, you know, where we're seeing uh, across the country a lot of new construction. We're seeing an Airbnb or short-term rental. Uh, we're on the cusp of a bust of that, I believe, because profits are down the, these operators thought it was going to be easy number one they they became self-employed people and we know that most of them fail within the first couple of years we're now getting into that part you know that i've talked to people all the time they're like man i had no idea you know it's all uh review driven and if you have somebody else clean it and there's a hair left on the yeah, whatever mm -hmm. you, you know where that's going it, it's said that and and keep in mind baby boomers were the largest age demographic that we've had for decades now millennials are you know surpassing that but but you're right i mean we learned a couple things we learned that um 
during COVID, these, uh, you know, older age demographic, they, they don't want to go into retirement communities where they could possibly be separated from their family. So we watch the conversion of aging in place, you know, take place in the household. We, we're now seeing because of affordability, um, you know, in some cases, we're seeing multi-generational households come back, which I don't think is a bad thing. But there, there's a number, and um, your, your uh, prior employer, Yahoo, on Yahoo Finance, they, it wasn't that long ago, uh, that they said that there was a silver tsunami coming, that there are 30 million houses that could potentially hit the market. And let's just say the next five years, if that's the case, right? When we're looking at an average year of home sales being somewhere between six and seven million houses a year, last year we didn't hit four million um, for obvious reasons. The inventory wasn't there, the unaffordability issues that we have. Uh, so a lot of the inventory that was available was either taken off the market or, you know, it's still sitting on the market with multiple price reductions. People don't want them um, still at their price, current pricing. But let's just say, like like you mentioned, we get a you know a wave of these single family houses hit the market from the short term rental. We I know plenty of landlords, long term rentals that have exited the business since they were hurt during you know don't you don't have to pay your rent, you don't have to pay your landlord. Right. They got enough of a taste of that that they want to sell everything that they have, not counting the tenant laws that are coming into you know more and more into play. The you know. Um, uh, rent controls that you you name it. Let's combine all this together. But here's the most disturbing part. Because you and I would think that in a housing crisis, we want affordability for our, our population to buy houses and take part of home ownership. Adam, as of September, I think it was September 20, uh, September, whatever date in 2023, there was a, a press release that I read in, um, I talked with an agent in our last Tuesday night live stream, where Fannie Mae, it was the 21st or 22nd bundle of non-performing loans they sold off to Wall Street. Mm-hmm. Where are these thousands and thousands and thousands of homes that are non-performing? They want to come out and toot their horn and say, we have no foreclosures. Well, yeah, I guess not. What you're doing is you're bundling them up and you're selling just like Obama did. He started this right back in the GFC, bundling them up, wetting the appetite of Wall Street companies to invest in single family housing. Why aren't we offering this these thousands of homes to and putting programs in place for people that are waiting and have been sidelined to buy these houses to live in. No, we're not doing that. And I can only imagine what the conversation is because I don't know, but I would be thinking, hmm, if I were in office in an election year, I don't want foreclosures. I might have a conversation with the uh, the company saying, "Hey, look, you just we're going to put these uh, non-performing mortgages, bundle them up. We're going to put them out for auction, and whoever wins, you can't do anything with them until after the election. You're just going to have to suck it up and try and pry the money out of the the people or what. I mean, I could be wrong, but I'm thinking to myself, why are why are why are they quietly doing this?" You know, they're not talking about it. 21, 22, as of September of 2023, there were 20 some rounds of loan sell offs in bundles of non performing loans while they're tooting their horn. No foreclosures. We've had nothing but years of modifications, you know, uh, moratoriums. You tell me what where what's yeah. happening with the inventory, and if the inventory does hit the market for these baby boomers selling, are we really going to have the opportunity for people these people to buy homes to live in, or is Wall Street just going to gobble them up like we've seen since two thousand and twelve? Yeah. So, um, 
I mean, it's a big question. And, right? and Adam, um, and before you say anything, look, yeah. this is the issue. And you talked about how the media just destroyed Peter Schiff. I mean, you know, they bring him on to make fun of, out of him. They called him Dr. Doom. They do, you know, whatever. Right. You and I are dedicating our life to bringing awareness to the issues that no one wants to talk about and and it, it doesn't hit mainstream i mean soros what would he just buy another 600 i heard or maybe 600 radio stations was that number right but why aren't why aren't we talking about this uh well it's a great question um i i believe the reason we're not talking about it is because um you know, it doesn't serve the interests of those that are currently running the system, right? They just want us to believe that everything's hunky dory and just keep doing what we're doing, keep consuming, right? Keep keep stretching for these high housing prices, and you know, uh, keep reelecting the folks who uh, you know who, who run for office. And I'm not trying to make that's not a partisan commentary. It's just hey, you know, there's there's a reason why on both sides of the aisle, you know, the faces don't really seem to change that much, right? Where we basically have a gerontocracy right in, in DC right now. Um, I, I'm going to make a slight tangent, but I, I promise it's it's related. Um, so I just did an interview earlier this week or last week with um, Chris Hamilton, who um, publishes a, a website called um, Economica. And he basically is a chartist. Um, and you may not recognize his name, uh, Todd, but I, I guarantee you'll recognize his charts when you've seen him. You, you've seen him all around uh, a, a lot of the the you know, kind of thin twit alternative finance uh, sites that you and I, I imagine spend our time on. And uh, the thing I think that that uh, demands his focus most is demographics. And he's really ringing a very loud warning bell that um, the US population is slowing fast. And this is happening, actually, it's really happening across the rest of the world with the exception of Africa. Um, but since most of the folks watching your program, I'm going to presume are, are Americans, I'll, I'll, I'll stick to the U S. Um, and, uh, like the, the, the number of births, uh, in the country has decreased by more than 20% since 2013, if I'm remembering this right, like that's a pretty big decline in a very short period of time. And if you look at, um, if you look at the natural birth rate in this country, uh, natural birth and natural death rate. Um, the U.S. Pop the natural born U.S. population will start shrinking by about 2035. Never happened before in our entire nation's history. You, 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 were, you were pulling up those numbers earlier, early on about how old each you know country is. Our country's been around for 250 years or whatever, um, and uh, I, we will now be shrinking for the first time. So that brings the the, the topic of immigration in, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get into that because that is a massive uh, conversation in and of itself. Um, but even if you even if you add immigration at status quo levels, um, we, we start shrinking overall in total population by 2050. And it's not just the size of your population that matters. What really matters is the size of your 25 to 54 year old population, because that's the productive par part of your uh, population that actually drives economic growth. And that part of, uh, in our country with natural born and immigrants um, is declining. Um, and so uh, we're basically looking at this demographic destiny of um, having fewer and fewer, not percentage wise, but just fewer and fewer absolute number of 25 to 54 year olds to drive our economy. So if we care about as a society, economic growth in the future, we have to care very, very much about that population cohort. Well, why is it declining? Well, a big reason it's declining is because younger generations are either deciding not to start families, and when they do, they have fewer families. And a big reason for that now, a very clear reason, is because kids are hella expensive, right? Um, so boomer generation, you know, had a lot more kids, didn't really worry about the cost of those kids. Now having kids is a very, very intentional and planful financial decision. And because, you know, I talked about earlier about the vast majority of the country really beginning to lose faith in the social contract, people are saying, I don't know if I can afford to have them, right? So this goes into everything you're talking about. So where I'm kind of going with all this is, look, we have created a, the way in which the country is being run, right? And I'm not casting blame here right now, 
um, just factually, the way in which it's being run is providing a disincentive for youth to procreate <laughs> uh, and to like aggressively pursue uh, a career because they, they don't feel like they're gonna get ahead by doing it, right? So we have a big policy problem right now. So to your questions that you're asking me, the answer is, is I don't expect a lot of change until we actually start having adult-sized discussions about this as a nation and then start making policy reform. You can't have that reform until you have the discussion. So it's sort of like the alcoholic that hasn't admitted they're an alcoholic yet, right? We're still in that stage. So, I, so I'm sad to say, I don't think much is going to change until we admit these big problems. Adam, I'm, I'm going to follow, have a follow-up to what you just said, and it may not be popular. And, you know, I, I, I can only imagine where the comments are going to go from here. And, and, uh, and, 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 I, and I want to start by saying this, that um, I'm not chauvinistic at all. I mean, I have, you know, uh, I, I, I love women in the workforce, and it, this has nothing to do with this at all. But my point is that I want to kind of drive back to sort of the formation of the American households we could live on one salary. So women, they worked at home. And I'm not saying that that's not a job. It is a very difficult job, right? So back in the day, you could raise a family with mom at home and, you know, dad out working. Now, if you guys can just not, you know, criticize me over over what I'm saying here and just listen, because this is to, uh, this comes on the back tail backspin of what Adam just spoke about. What we did is we removed mom from the house, raised prices on everything, so that now these people that want to have kids, these you know men and women want to have kids they can't afford it or the so what they have to do now is and look and so now it's downplay well what do you do for a living well i'm i'm a housewife it's like oh really i mean i mean we have made it to where that's a what kind of rewarding life is that well i mean we could raise our own kids for crying out loud we could not put them in a daycare center that doesn't care about the kind of education that they get we can make sure that we're teaching them instead of our schools teaching them right but we we can't go back to that these people when we get back to real estate and i know this is a rant man and i'm, I'm probably it's going to light up in the comments but <laughs> but listen we are seeing houses median income for the first time in the gfc okay the index the housing affordability index it has the you know the 100 line on this chart means that median income earners can afford a median home a, a median priced home at 100 adam during the gfc when we hit the peak somewhere around june of 2006 every state was different when that peak happened we never fell below the 100 line, meaning that even the peak of unaffordable housing, the prices of homes with all the madness of people, your neighbors going out and buying investment property, we did not go below that line. The first time since they've been tracking this over 25 years, maybe, we are under, we are in the 90s where people are needing to pay eight sometimes seven, eight, nine times earnings to buy a home. These right. numbers do not work. You are not going to have people wanting to have kids and, and bear the expense of daycare when they are out just enslaved to debt. So if, if I can just make things even a little bit darker before we try to pull people's heads out of the ovens here. Um, so back to these charts that that chris hamilton um presented he shows and again it's it's all sort of in this cohort growth of the 25 to 20 25 to 54 year olds um that was growing uh strongly from the post-world war era to like the early 90s um and and the economy grew a lot right and so we basically grew the economy on people power 
And we grew it on people power by growing people, right? So we had the baby boom, right? Which is a big part of that. Um, they were helped by, you know, some uh, technology efficiencies, but it was also helped a lot by bringing women into the workforce, to your point there, right? Which is kind of a way of keeping the party going, but increasing the cost of the party, right? So we, we, we broke up the nuclear family and we said, look, mom, you can't stay home anymore. You got to go to work uh, to, you know, to, to keep us where we are, right? One income is not going to do it anymore. Um, but then that started not being enough to drive economic growth. And as that cohort started to hit its apex and started to shrink, we had to make up the differential somewhere if we wanted to continue similar economic growth. So what did we do? We started borrowing a lot more as a nation. Um, and so you can you can clearly see in this chart that as the um, uh, as the growth of that cohort began began to stop growing and then go into reverse, the debt starts leaping up by higher and higher bounds, right? And so the question that you have to ask yourself there is, is you know, look, debt is a way of pulling tomorrow's prosperity into today, right? So it's it's not it's not value creation in and of itself. You're stealing t tomorrow's value creation to enjoy it today, right? So what happens when tomorrow catches up, right? What happens when you have cohorts that are born in the tomorrow and they're saying, "Wait a minute, where's my prosperity?" Right? That's literally what we're starting to see here, right? And eventually, the debt gets to a point at which it can't. The cost of servicing the debt is so expensive that it just, you know, eats everything else up. And there's no prosperity left over from that. So it does raise a very big question of sort of what comes next. And this is where, you know, I get so, I would say, concerned slash pessimistic in my long term view, because I don't see the easy out from there. I certainly don't see an out from there without a lot of pain. Um, and so we're going to need, you know, hopefully that pain to your question earlier, uh, that pain produces the type of leaders who will make the hard reforms. And yeah, I'm not going to pretend that that's not going to be a not fun period to live through. And I don't know exactly when it's going to happen, um, but it's going to need to happen at some point, because if it doesn't, it's just going to be forced upon us by reality. You know, the problem that concerns me is that the divide, you know, and, and not getting political, but, you know, it used to be that they could reach across the aisles and, you know, shake hands and go out and, you know, have, the old have Tip O'Neill and Reagan having a beer afterwards. Exactly. Yeah. And, and now the divide is just so we are at so, such extremes that if anybody, you know, is, is contrary to the, uh, what you're getting right now, I mean, you're really, you know, um, you're, you're, you're sought out. I mean, it's, you know, they, you, you, they're, they're coming after you and, and, and this is the crazy part. So yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm with you. So let's kind of wind this down with where we are in, uh, with the fed. So everybody was expecting him, right. There's core inflation core, you know, uh, CPI numbers that came out from January. We know that it's worse than what they reported. Um, the Fed, everybody baked in rate cuts. Powell had a, I don't know if you saw the 60 minute uh, interview. Did you see that with Powell? Yep. Yep. I think he was pretty clear that politics weren't going to play into uh, the job at hand. Uh, so despite any political pressures, he made it clear that the job at hand is to reduce inflation. Do you see higher for longer? Do you think it will be June? And by the way, higher for longer will destroy the housing market. I mean, for sellers to get the maximum amount of money for their their house in traditional years, you have to sell it before June 15th. Because after June 15th, that's when we start to see things, you know, decline. And in a normal market, price declines through summer, spring's the best time. So any kind of rate cuts, even though the Fed rate has nothing to do with mortgage rates, we know they mirror uh, themselves a lot. It has everything to do with mm -hmm. the 10-year treasury. Do you think that we'll see, we'll skip March on, what do you think is going to happen in the March meeting? I know nobody has crystal ball, a crystal ball, <laughs> but if you had to say, like, this is kind of like my gut feeling, what do you see mm -hmm. the Fed doing? When do you see the first rate cut? Okay, um, I don't see them cutting in March. Um, 
and look, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, but I think I, I, I think I know what's important in this story, which is, um, look, I, I have, I, I would say inflation, the future of inflation is the most disputed subject on the folks that I talk with on my channel. Probably about half of them think we're in a secularly higher inflation regime than we're, than we've been and that it's going to be really hard for the fed to get down to 2%. Uh, the other half saying it's, it's going to be a piece of cake to get inflation under 2%. In fact, if you go to Trueflation right now, which is a, a site that measures inflation from a basket of goods, it doesn't monkey around with hedonics and you know substitution and all the stuff that the official numbers do. That's down in the like 1.7 or 8% range right now, I think. So you know they're confident that, look, um, inflation's already pretty tamed. It's all over, but the crying. And of course, if the lag effects kick in, that that's going to depress things even further. Um, so I honestly don't know how sticky inflation is going to play out. But to the spirit of your question, here's what I think matters, right, is even if the Fed does cut, can it ride to the market's rescue in time, right? So we have this maturity wall for corporate America where they raised, you know, smartly raised a ton of capital back when rates were really cheap. That's what's been keeping them afloat, especially the, the cohort of zombie uh, corporations. Um, is that their debt hasn't re-rated yet. But we have almost a trillion dollars in debt, corporate debt re-rating this year, and we have even more re-rating in the following year, right? So if, if rates don't come down materially in the near future, it's going to be vastly Im uh, impactive of those comp companies, right? They're going to they're be forced to start entering cost-cutting measures, right? Where, okay, my debt service costs went up, I got to start finding ways to cut costs. I think that could be the trigger that finally weakens the employment situation. That has been the bulwark against inflation, right? And I mentioned earlier that the employment situation is probably likely not nearly as strong as we're being told, but it's still strong enough, right? We're not seeing hundreds of thousands of layoffs that we've seen, you know, in previous recessions, right? If we get into that type of world, man, then it's then it's game on for those that are expecting a recession. Right, because you have people start uh, cutting their their spending because they've either lost their job or they saw their neighbor lose their job, and so they start getting more conservative. Then corporations make less money, and they have to do even more cost cutting measures. And you get that vicious cycle that we tend to see, you know, when it, once recessions get underway. Right. So my question is: is look, let's say the Fed delivers three rate cuts this year, so it's bringing the Fed funds rate down from what you know five and a quarter to four and a half. Right, like that's still way higher than what the the economy has been used to for the previous couple of decades. Right, same thing with the mortgage market. Okay, we could shave, you know, let's shave a full percentage point off the mortgage rate. Yeah, that'll help, right? But mortgages would still be twice as expensive as where they were two and a half years ago, right? So, you know, can't I think the big question is is not exactly what it's going to do, but but will what it does be enough in time to support the status quo? I have a lot of pessimism around that. Prior to the pandemic, major corporations were looking at ways to get rid of employees through automation. This is this is the internet of things has been, you know, creeping up on us. I think COVID slowed it down. I think what happened was when the pandemic hit, corporations were in this transitionary period where they were reducing their office needs. They were sending people remote. They were hiring independent contractors so they could have the- Keep going because I'm right there with you. They could, I've been talking about this for a long time. They, could, going. they could have the best of the best in, in, as independent contractors, but with rising healthcare, rising costs for the business, they have- shareholders that are demanding returns, stock prices that have been going up. And I think what happened was when COVID hit, they were like, well, we're not ready yet. We're not ready to send our entire workforce home. We couldn't even get computers. But then what happened was they profited from it. Oh, now I have all of these rounds of stimulus, this PPP money that I can get my hands on, right? So they were... And then the ERB. After yeah, that, yeah, yeah, exactly. So now what's happening is businesses are coming back to their senses again, and nothing's really changed from where they were headed 
prior. I mean, really, we started seeing it in 2017 where offices were thinning down and these building owners, these office building owners were going, geez, they're not renewing or instead of needing 44,000 square feet, they only need 11, right? We used to call it head down desk space. Everybody, you remember the day, everybody had their own office, their own desk, their own door, their own. We walked away, you know, we're getting away from all of that. People were going to part-time employees so that they could avoid paying these costly, you know, insurance uh, you know, premiums for healthcare and stuff like that. So, I mean, I think, I think yep. what's going to happen is well, you said it, the thread and the only thing that's kept the housing market. So we're looking at uh, 2022, 2021, 2022 home prices. We allowed the uh, asset class of housing to get completely out of control at 2.74 percent 30-year fixed rate mortgages we just there was no sky was the limit we saw appraisals coming in and bumping up faster than we've ever seen because the comps were showing because of the amount of cash and overpaying you know uh, appraised value that caught up very quickly and now we're looking at your builders have been offering five and a half percent a lot of these builders for six months they're, they're showing the future. How do you move inventory? You lower the price and you give cheaper loans. Right? But you know what? That's, that's what still not take. work. That, but but Adam, that's still not working for them. I mean, well, because they're not going low. In October, yeah, I mean, it's, it's showing us where the market has to go to clear. Is what I'm in saying. In October, they showed the worst in decades. You know, uh, the worst numbers in the new ha- new home construction, uh, you know, market as far as profits. They showed the worst month in. October of 2023, then the, you know, the GFC, you know, as far as sales numbers being, they couldn't entice these buyers. Wasn't anything. They so could can, do. can I build off of your thing? We're, we're going to, we were trying to help people take their heads out of the oven. Now I'm going to shove it right back <laughs> in. Um, so, uh, I mean, I wrote a piece back, I think in 2014 called automating ourselves to employment, uh, to unemployment. And it basically was talking about how you've heard of the term malinvestment. Right. Um, I was I was talking about a term or maybe inventing a term called malincentive. So uh, we have been providing a tremendous malincentive to businesses for 20 more years now to 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 try to find whatever ways they can to get by on fewer and fewer human capital. Right. We've been making it more and more expensive to hire employees. Right. You talked about the insurance costs and then there's OSHA and then there's just, you know, we're, we're forcing, you know, minimum wage up by, you know, here in California, where now all of a sudden fast food workers are getting paid, you know, 20 bucks an hour minimum wage. And, and I don't I don't want to say whether that's a good or bad thing. I just want to say that that makes it a lot harder for the businesses that we're running <laughs> to hire more people. In fact, a lot of them, once these wage force increases get forced on them, they actually reduce their workforce and or reduce hours, right? So the point is, is it's it's just been getting more and more expensive to hire employees over recent decades. And so companies doing the responding to that incentive are saying, okay, well, how can I reduce my dependence on human workers? And during the ZERP era, we made it really cheap for them to borrow, to invest in things like robotics and automation and software um, globalization made it easy to farm as many jobs as you possibly could out to a lower wage worker in a, in a more affordable country, right? So um, that process was well underway, like you said, until COVID happened, right? COVID happened, everybody fired people right away, and then they realized, oh, it's super hard to hire these people back. And a big part of that is because we made it easier for those people not to have to rush back to the office, right? Because they were getting checks in the mail and forbearance programs and stuff like that. So generals always fight the last battle. So that scar of, of how hard it was to, to win back people they had fired is still at the forefront of you know, the, the executives of these companies. So they've engaged in what's called labor hoarding, right? Where they hired, especially in tech, more people than really they truly needed. But also they've just been reluctant to fire because they're, they're remembering the pain of a few years ago. I don't want to let this guy go and then find out I, I, I need him again in a year and then he's been snapped up by somebody, right? So they've been, they've been holding on to talent longer than they otherwise normally would. And they've been doing so on the hope that the Fed would ride to their rescue and that they'd be able to, you know, the economy would be back in an upswing. And, and the economy has actually been doing okay 
over the past year, right? But that's been artificially supported like we talked about, right? So if we start entering into slower economic growth and tougher times, and by the way, the um, Atlanta Fed GDP now just cut its GDP estimate from over four to like two and a half um, with uh, the, the payroll data that just came out, the disappointing, um, not payroll data, sorry, um, retail sales data that came out. Um, so who knows, maybe, maybe we're already starting to enter into some lower growth. Um, but, but, but when that happens, when companies start realizing, you know what, I'm not going to be able to grow my way out of this, especially with this maturity wall coming my way, that belief of I've got to hold on to these workers longer than I should, that's going to flip. It's going to flip to, you know what, I got to start shedding costs because I see this, this tidal wave of, 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 uh, either slower sales coming my way and or higher debt service costs. And so that's gonna turn on a dime. And that's when we're gonna start seeing a real flushing of the system. And it'd probably be pretty pronounced at first because whoever they've been holding on to that they've said, I really, this guy's really not doing much for me, but I don't wanna give up my labor hoarding strategy yet. All that pent up you know, kind of people that are not seen as pulling their freight, they're gonna get dumped fast and early. So we're gonna see this pretty quickly. So my point being is, is, you know, now with AI coming, right, take everything that we were doing prior to the pandemic and, and turn it up on steroids, right, which is, hey, if I can get rid of anybody, you know, anybody I can using AI and AI now puts, you know, even higher uh, skill level jobs at risk, um, everything you just talked about just gets even worse, right? So so back to our, our comment about like this this more challenging environment that we're creating for society at large, but certainly younger cohorts, no wonder it's harder for them to find a job, right? Because the companies are, are gaining an increasingly upper hand and saying, I don't need real people to work for me, right? And to your point, during the COVID period where all of this stimulus was, was in hitting everybody's bank accounts, businesses were busy and they needed these extra. It's it, it, just like you said. So if, if I have a warehouse and I'm selling these widgets, and all of a sudden, I sell out on all of my widgets. What am I going to do? I'm going to buy more widgets, and I'm going to buy a lot more widgets. I'm going to I'm going to buy double and triple widgets because I don't want to run out. Because if I run out, I can't make the money on the profit. They did the same. To your point, they did the same thing with labor. They recruited. They gave sign-on bonuses. They paid more than they ever had. Right? They're hiring people, and that they're starting out making a lot more money than the people that have been with them ten years. Now, all of a sudden, we're seeing a drawback in the business, you know, uh, sector. Like you said, the earnings on, you know, uh, for holiday sales down. Right? But now there's they have these earning reports that they have to deal with and what they're looking at you know as well as i do from being in that space it's all about keeping the shareholders happy right because if all of a sudden profitability starts declining their uh, shares are being sold people are pulling out confidence level drops it's a spiral that happens very quickly so what do we do we close non you know uh, non-performing locations we saw it in the gfc the problem with this time adam is it's so much worse because we've never seen the debt in this nation to where it is right now. What what, what do you have in, in kind of closing us out here? I know you, you had said that you had, I mean, I could, uh, look, you and I, we could talk for hours. We could talk hours. forever. And by the way, it's been a real pleasure to meet you. I'm, I'm so glad you reached out and, and I'd love to continue this conversation anytime you want we'll to do it likewise likewise is there anything we, 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 else? for the three people who have made it here past the two hour mark <laughs> <laughs> that's right there you go you know what i believe though uh we do a lot of long form and i think people are very interested in what you have to say and i am again i'm so honored to to have you on center stage because you, you don't give yourself enough credit you are so bright and i listen to the questions that you ask and i could tell and you you are um you're so respectful of your guests and you know but i could and watching some of your interviews i i could tell when you're like yeah well i, I not necessarily agree with that but hey it's a <laughs> I, i'm glad you pulled that point out and you give me a new way to look at it and things like that so adam i just wanted to give you the stage the platform i know a lot of my audience they love you 
They watch you. We're publishing everything about you, including your Substack, in the show notes for anybody uh, to, to find. Uh, but anything, Adam, in uh, closing us out here? Well, first, I want to say you're being very kind to me. Thank you. I want to say right back at you. Um, you do a wonderful job. And, and you, I feel like you take a, a similar philosophy as I, where you know some of the points you make. Uh, when I give an interview, uh, when I'm in your seat, it's not about me or my thoughts. My job is just to bring out what's inside the interviewer's head. And if they have differing opinions, great. That's what makes a market. We should try to understand what, what smart people who think differently uh, than us, um, we should try to understand their logic. Um, but you're a very, you're a very skilled and gracious host at that. So thank you. I also want to commend you. Um, sounds like your audience is a lot like mine, where I've, I've actually, I've had some interviews that go over three hours and, and still had people complain that it didn't go longer. Like I've actually, I've yet to find the maximum uh, of, of content uh, duration that my, my audience wants. And, and I think that's because to your point, people are really hungry for substance. And this is something that I think the, the, the media, the traditional media has really kind of cut off its nose to, to spite its face on where they've, they've become so dependent upon the advertising model that um, they have to follow, you know, where the eyeballs are, right? Like, so what, what attracts, what's going to get somebody to tune into my program tomorrow, right? And uh, generally that tends to be, um, what I consider to be more entertainment, really, than information. Um, it's all about the soundbite. You know, if you, if you the, the platform I hear criticized the most by my viewers is CNBC, right? Where um, it's always a good time to buy stocks. No matter what happens in the world, it's always a good time to buy stocks. And that's because their advertisers are big ETFs that want you to be buying their product, right? And uh, again, to, to, to create the, the sizzle factor, they're just, trying to get people on and try to get a quick soundbite out of them and then it's on to the next topic right and that's that's not actionable insight for you know for an investor you 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 want to get actually the full nuanced story so that you can then make an informed decision so that's what i try to do at thoughtful money clearly that's what you try to do here and i want to thank you for that because i, I hear from people how starved they are for what i call financially nutritious content and there aren't that many people out there taking in my opinion both the right approach, but also just the right time to have these conversations at the depth that they deserve. So again, I want to give you kudos for that. Um, in wrapping up, I just want to tell folks, um, I'm sorry if, if we got into some you know pretty depressing territory here. I think a huge part of that is just understanding the nature of the game. That's really, I think, all we're trying to do is say, like it or not, this is the world in which we're operating because with that information, you can then make informed decisions. And the good news is, is yes, there's some things that you're not gonna be able to affect with your own personal agency. You're not gonna be able to um, reverse uh, the decline in um, you know, the 25 to 54 year old cohort. Um, you're not gonna be able to affect what the Fed decides to do at the next FOMC meeting. But there is a lot of personal agency you have in this story. Uh, to be able to control your destiny. And as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, I think the name of the game for investors today is to get educated, uh, positioned and resourced well enough uh, to be able to build sufficient wealth that you then focus on addressing that key question I mentioned earlier, which is, okay, how do I take this wealth and how do I make sure that it grows at a rate faster than the depreciation of the underlying currency that it's valued in? Um, there are lots of ways to do that. We talked about some of them on this program. Um, but I would say, you know, the ways to do that are to get better educated. So keep watching programs like this one. Um, and um, uh, if you are feeling a bit overwhelmed or, or, or not prepared yourself to be kind of captain of your ship through this type of future that Todd and I have been talking about, find a good professional financial advisor who can be your financial quarterback for that. And, and even though I refer people to advisors that I endorse, I'm impartial. I don't care who you work with. I just want them to be good, right? So if you've got a good one who's doing that for you, great, stick with them or, or you know, go out and find a good one. If not, you know, Todd can tell you how to find me and, and, and find a way to have a free consultation with the guys that I endorse. And those consultations are no commitment. They're literally just free public services these guys offer. But like I said, I'm not trying to push that. What I am trying to push is if you don't feel confident of being your own steward of your wealth in this environment, find a quality professional who can play that role for you. Well said. Thank you so much, Adam. Total pleasure, Todd. Thank you so much. 
Wow, what an amazing interview. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, hit that thumbs up. It'll let Adam know that you did. And if you haven't subscribed to our channel, consider doing so now. Smash that alert bell and you'll know every time we upload content just like this. And do me a favor, cruise on over. If you don't follow Thoughtful Money, give Adam a, uh, a subscribe as well. I think you'll really enjoy the content that he produces. See you next time. Sachs Realty, Maryland Broker, number 607720, office number 443-318-4514, equal housing opportunity.